Thank you. you. May be seated. And let's take our song books and turn to song number, uh, I'm sorry, let's take our Bibles and turn this to uh, Pat, uh, Mark, chapter Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. The second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, 16. Last chapter of Mark, chapter 16, and verse number 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. This is part two on following up and visitation uh, that we started last week. Let's pray. Again, dear God, please bless uh, this Bible study this morning. I help this to be a help and a blessing. Thank the Lord for these dear folks that are here. Help us to pay attention. These words are not unimportant. Every single word in the Bible is important. And help us to listen and to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> As we said last week, God visits. And there's two kinds of visits in the Bible when God visits. A good visit and a bad visit. A righteous judgment or a blessing. So God can visit people to heal them, or God can visit people to uh, destroy them, to be honest with you. Uh, the Bible says, is there evil in the city and God hath not done it? God's allowed it. So even the good things that we like, or even the bad things that we don't like, all al are allowed by God for whatever God's purpose is. Having said that, God confirms by visiting uh, people as like his stamp, I don't want to say stamp of approval, but his stamp that he allowed it. For instance, in this verse, um, the Bible says, if you know, if you've been here for the series on the tongues and, and uh, the miracles for the, I don't know, eight, ten weeks that we were going through, God confirmed the power of God, the Holy Spirit, with tongues and wonders and miracles during the New Testament uh, church beginning, the beginning of the New Testament of the foundation of the church. And so God confirmed that and visited them and the power of God was evident amongst the people that were saved. Just like, be honest with you, now, I'm not, look, I, I preached enough that for those who've been coming here for, for any length of time know that you don't judge somebody's salvation by how, by how they live. But nonetheless, there are evidences of salvation after you get saved that God does confirm, not just to you, but to other people, that that's a child of God. So you don't go around and say, well, he's not saved, she's saved, I don't think he's saved, I don't think he's really saved. That's not what we're talking about. It's just God confirms and visits. When, 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 when you conform your life to the Bible, God is confirming to other people about the Bible. When you change your life, not for salvation. When you change your life because you love God, you don't have to say much to people. Now, I didn't know, understand this uh, when I first got saved, and you probably didn't understand it because you're trying to tell everybody, you know, what they're doing wrong, like I did. You know, I wish somebody had told me to shut up. But the truth of the matter is, you, my Sunday school teacher used to say this all the time. He said, your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Let me repeat that. Your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. So God confirms and God visits through people and uses people to speak to other people through you. And so you have to understand that God was confirming the power of his power through these disciples with signs and wonders and tongues and all these other things. And God just confirmed to them and to others around them that these are the children of God. These are the this is the power of God 
that is uh, foretold, that was prophesied, and is now available for people to see. Look at Ezekiel chapter number uh, 13, please. Ezekiel 13. God visits. By the way, God's waiting to hear from you every single morning. Right? Uh, and you should be waiting to hear from God when you open the Word of God. People say, well, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know if God's speaking to me. That's because you're not reading the Bible. You're not reading, if, if you're reading the Bible, God's speaking to you. Ezekiel chapter number 16, uh, 13 rather, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 13. Starting in verse number 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, that prophesy, and say thou unto them, that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Now these are false prophets. These are false prophets that are prophesying lies in God's name. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. You talk to people all the time, say, Oh, I saw God, or I heard this. You know, audibly, they're false. I'm just telling you, they're false. That's a different dispensation. And they weren't, they're not a prophet. They're not writing any Old Testament scriptures. They're just lying. Verse number four. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, watch this, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. They have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. So a lot of these charlatans are, are depending on their followers to confirm for them uh, that supposedly God is using them to try to gain other people that don't know the Bible. You better be careful because you can easily be swayed by people who support you when you're doing wrong. You can be supported by doing something wrong. No matter what you do in life, good or bad, somebody will support you. Now, the more good you do, the less support you're going to get. Because the more you obey God, the less people are going to like it. But if you go out and sin, you're going to get a lot of support. All right, if you say, I'm not going back to church, you say, hey, man, join the club. I'm not going back there anymore. Join the, the uh, uh, IFB uh, recovery group, you know. We're going to have recovery uh, sessions every Friday, every Sunday. Instead of going to church, we'll have recovery groups, you know. Yeah, join our crew. Because I know he mistreated me too, and that church was overbearing, and they were legalistic, and they were a cult. You get a lot of people to support you when you're not right with God. They want to confirm, they want you to confirm them, just like God uses people to confirm himself to other people. You better be careful because it's like, like I said before, it's like almost a stamp of approval for whatever you're doing or whatever God's doing. We have church this morning. The only reason this church has survived is because of God. That's the only reason. You can't look at an earthly reason and say, well, you know, we don't have too many rich people. I should say any, but I'm just saying we don't have too many, you know. We don't have too many, I don't know, uh, well-to-do people, you know, well-connected people. It's just a ragtag team of people who have surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ the best they know how. It's just a motley crew of people who have come together and say, you know what? I may not love God the way I, I should, but I want to love him, amen? And that's what God's looking for. Nobody in here has walked on water. You, you know, nobody's raised the dead. And so we're all a bunch of sinners trying, hopefully, to live for God, to do the best we can, better than we did yesterday or the day before. You know what that is? That's God visiting. That's God confirming to others uh, so-and-so is proof of salvation. I think it's Ironside, I remember. Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah 35. Um, H.A. Ironside told the story one time, I think it was Ironside, Isaiah 35, where he was preaching on uh, restitution. If you're saved, you're a child of God, you ever steal something, you ought to 
Make it right. Amen. You ought to make it right. If you hurt somebody, you ought to make it right. That's part of uh, being a Christian. Because we're sinners, you ought to forgive others. Others ought to forgive you. But you personally ought to make it right with somebody that you've hurt or you stole from. And after the sermon, I guess, somebody came up to him and said, um, I'm in a pickle. And I'm, you know, using my version, the best I can remember, he says, I'm in a pickle. I don't know what to do because my boss thinks I'm a very, very faithful uh, worker. And uh, again, this is back about 75, 80 years ago. And uh, I work at a, at a boatyard, shipyard, uh, making boats for my boss who owns the shipyard, <clears throat> making the company that makes the boats. And what we do is we use copper nails because the copper nails don't rust in the water. So a lot of the boats, you know, the mahogany boats and the old boats before fiberglass came out, we use copper nails. And he said, what I've been doing without him knowing it, because, you know, I always thought he had a lot of money. Didn't, he's not going to miss them. I was taking copper, copper nails home. And with all these copper nails I was taking home, I was making my own boat. My boss thinks I'm a good worker, but he hates Christianity. He doesn't think much about Christianity. If I go back to him right now and tell him, that I stole all these copper nails, he's really going to have it in for me. He's going to fire me. He's going to hate me even worse. He said, and he said, you do whatever you want to do. I'm just telling you, I, I preach a sermon. So he came back later on and said, you know what? I cleared my conscience. I'm, I'm preaching the sermon this morning on your conscience. And I told my boss. He said, because his boss was saying, you know what? All, all Christians are, are hypocrites. That's what he said before this. He said, what's your boss saying? He said, I forget the guy's name now. He said, he said, you know what? I always thought you were a hypocrite before. <laughs> but any religion that can make you come back and ask for forgiveness for sinning against somebody and something that I didn't even know about, it's got to be something about it, he said. Hear what he just said? See, a lot of times you think about your own pride and your ego and your job and your money and your hurt feelings. But don't tell me that you haven't hurt somebody. Don't tell me you haven't let somebody down. Don't tell me you haven't stolen anything. You go ahead and work for the state of New York. I'm sorry. You go ahead and be employed by the state of New York for 28 years like I was. And it's very easy to see people take pens and paper clips. You say, oh, the state's got money. It's all taxpayer money anyway. You do the same thing at your work. I remember when I was working in the banquet house room, I had the brass keys to every single suite at the... Uh, at the fancy hotel there, and I had forgot all about it. I had having a plastic bag, every single brass key for every single suite where I was working as a banquet houseman. And unbeknownst to me, I shouldn't say unbeknownst, but I just completely forgot about it. And I put it in the basement of my, where I was living, in my parents' house, in the basement, and it's a dust, dirty old plastic bag. And I was sitting in Sunday school, I think, or I was reading the Bible, I can't remember exactly where I was. And all of a sudden, I either heard something on making it right, restitution, making things right. And I always, then I, I remember that plastic bag with all the grass keys. And my conscience was bothering me. So you know what I did? I went down there, picked up the bag, got in my car, went to the bank, pulled out like two, three hundred dollars. I can't remember for the life of me. I wish I could remember. I went two, three hundred dollars. And I walked into the office of the man who was in charge of the banquet houseman. I walked in there, I said, sir, you don't know me, but I used to work here three, four, five years ago, whatever time frame it was. And while I was working here, I stole quite a bit of stuff, <laughs> silverware and sugar. And uh, I said, these keys. And I plopped them right on his, right on his desk, <laughs> right there. <laughs> Can you, brass keys, I'm talking about 20 or 30, you know, I don't know how many stories high it was, and I plop, plop, plopped them right on his desk. That clanging made a lot of noise. Pulled out the two, three hundred dollars that I had, I said, this is uh, for, the, for the stuff I took. <laughs> and I, I was sweating bullets, man. I was sweating bullets. I had, a, I had a three by five card with my name, my address, and my telephone number on there. I said, if you want to reach me, you want to call me or call the police, here's where I can be found at. I didn't ask for any questions. I just turned around and left. To this day, I haven't heard back from him. <laughs> but I walked out with a clear conscience. Without me understanding it all, you know what happened? God visited that man. I had, a, I had chick tracks. I had a whole bunch of other tracks. I, don't, I can't remember now. I had like three, four different tracks. I just left them on, on this desk right there at the office, and I turned around, and I left because I was, I was really nervous. But I walked out with a clear conscience. God visited 
that man, whoever it was, God visited that man. You'd be shocked what God will do, how he can visit people. And God will visit people through you. And God will visit you through other people if you let him. If you let him. I told you, I'm not, I'm not saying you should go ahead and do this, but, you know, Dave Wilson, private, one of the closest friends I've ever had in my life, if not the closest, he was uh, going through a toll booth. You remember they used to have toll booths before? <laughs> and uh, as his custom was, and mine is, um, was, he give a track out to the clerk there at the toll booth. And as he's handing out the gospel track there, the person, I guess, in the middle, right in the midst of the transaction there, the guy must have realized it was a gospel track and didn't take it. And Dave thought he was going to take it and let his hands go and the track fell down on the ground. Well, Dave got upset, man. The guy was looking at Dave. Dave got in, in, car's behind him now. He gets out of his car, upset. Dave Wilson gets upset, man. He's upset. He gets out of his car, goes down, picks up the track, gets in the car, slams the car door. And the guy, the guy must have felt really bad. He said, okay, okay. He said, I'll take it. And Dave Wilson turns around and said, no, you want to burn hell? Go ahead. And drives off. Now, I'm not saying that's how you would go to so on, but don't tell me that guy's not going to remember that. Don't tell me that God's not going to speak to his heart when somebody tried to witness to him, give him a gospel track, and then before he drives off, he says, no, you want to burn in hell? Go ahead. And drives off. You'd be shocked how God can use you if you let him. You'd be shocked how God can visit you and visit others through you if you let him. Isaiah chapter number 35, please. Verse number 1. Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of, of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. My ministry, Grace Baptist Church, is not out to uh, impress people. Be very careful of that. Nowhere in the Bible do you see anywhere Jesus going to the rich people. He went to poor people. Hello? Lepers, publicans, tax collectors, sinners. That's who he went to. The woman caught in adultery, brought to him. It's interesting... The rich people like Nicodemus came to him at nighttime. Because they didn't, you know, how rich people are. They got an ego. They, wanna, they don't want anybody to know that they're going to see Jesus. Well, that's how our ministry ought to be. Blessed be God. If rich people want to come, that's great. I'm not going to chase rich people out. If they can take the preaching, they're welcome to be here. Just like an adulterer or fornicator or a thief. Child molester, murderer, rapist. If you can sit still in the service, you're welcome. If you don't cause any problems, you're welcome. But everybody's welcome to come to hear the same kind of sermon, amen? Well, the rich people came to Jesus at nighttime because they didn't want their friends and their associates to, uh, to know that they were going to Jesus, like Nicodemus, who eventually got saved. Well, God says, confirm the feeble knees. That means you ought to encourage, they ought to go by and visit and encourage people not to quit. It's easy to, if you have a rich friend who's a multimillionaire, it's easy to go by because you know what, maybe he, uh, for whatever reason, he may give you a blessing or, or uh, be a blessing to you financially. So in the back of your mind, you have your, this thought, well, maybe, you know, they'll give me something. They'll help me when I need help. But you know what? It's always best when you can help somebody who can't help you because only God can help you then. If you help somebody who cannot help you back, who's unable to help you back, only God can help you then. So God says in verse number three, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. People that are doubting, not the dis doubtful disputation, people who are, who are struggling, you're supposed to help them and encourage them. You're supposed to show up in God's stead. That's what Moses did. He showed up in God's stead. That's what a man of God is. He shows up in God's stead. That's what you're for. You show up in God's stead. When you're, look, you say, I'm not that good of a Christian, pastor. All right, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. 
but your family thinks that you're the best Christian they know probably. To your family, relatives and friends, you're probably the closest thing to a Bible-believing Christian. Unless you're honest and say, I'm backslidden, I'm not right with God, I'm rebellious. Don't, don't look for me for examples. I mean, you can say that if you're honest. But most people that come to this church, your friends and your families think that you're as close to Jesus Christ as anything they've ever seen. Well, what is that? That's God using you. That's con God confirming visiting them through you. Daniel chapter number... Uh, well, you know, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 first. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Verse number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse number 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So the, the more you grow in grace, the more you read your Bible, the more you learn from the Bible, God's confirming the testimony that's in you, the Lord Jesus Christ, to yourself and to others. And it's very important for you to understand, the more you read your Bible, the more you can be used of God. The more you come to church, the more you'll be used of God. The more you pray for others. Why? You can't pray for somebody 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning and then get upset at them and angry at them just about six hours later. It doesn't happen. The reason why you get upset with people and angry at somebody is because you haven't been praying for them. If somebody hurts you real bad at 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, if you prayed for them just about five, six hours prior to that, your heart would be broken for them, not angry at them. You may be disappointed, but you wouldn't be angry. Now, there's a time to be anger, angry, I agree. But most times, you shouldn't be angry you should be, um, you know what, I want you to know I love you. Is there anything I do to help? What can I do? That, that's what your attitude ought to be. Not one of, of uh, immediate response of being angry at somebody. And by the way, when you're angry at somebody like that for almost no cause, it's just an indication of really what's in your heart. What's it, because that's what comes out. Somebody pushes your button, it comes out. So that's an indication of what's already in your heart towards God and towards other people, you know? Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis 50. I'm not exactly sure which ones I read last week. Genesis chapter number 50. Starting in verse number 22, Genesis 50, 5, 0, verse 22. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived in 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took, an, Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. You know what happened? 
God visited. Just like Joseph said. We read, we read the verse last week, I think it was Luke chapter number 10, where Jesus sent two and two out, the 70 out, two by two, before his face where he was going to go. You're going to meet Jesus Christ one day in person. You're going to stand before God Almighty and give an account. God's visiting you here to prepare you for that visit there. You're not going to cancel that visit. You're not going to cancel that appointment. You're not going to wish, you're going to say, you know, something came up, Pastor, I can't make it. Uh, no, no. You're going to be there. Everybody's going to stand before God and give an account, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to have God visit your mind now by reminding you you're going to, there's a visit that's coming that you're not going to get out of. Well, God surely, and by the way, God's going to visit America <laughs> not in a very good way. God visited America about 400 years ago in a good way. The most blessed land on planet Earth for the last 500 years, man. It really is. Fruitful bounty, gold, silver, mountains, water, creeks. I mean, everything you can imagine. Uh, livestock, deer, bear, fish, springs of water and rivers running and ocean wide. From ocean to ocean. I mean, you can't ask for a better country land-wise. God visited 400 years ago. When those Anabaptists and Huguenots landed on the shores of Florida, when the pilgrims landed, this is before the pilgrims landed. Those Baptists and Anabaptists and Huguenots landed on the shores of Florida before the pilgrims landed in 1620. But God used different people to visit this land. And God's given us freedom and liberty. For the most part, for three, four hundred years. Even before uh, the United States of America came into existence. That was a good visit. The visit that's coming is not going to be very good. You just got to read your Bible. It's not going to be good. The end time visit is going to happen. You can't change it. You can't alter it. It's going to come. It's going to happen. The best thing to do is for you to prepare for what's coming. Prepare for that visit. Exodus 32, please. Exodus 32. Exodus 32. And God just confirms his word exactly what he says. God does exactly what he says he's going to do. Exodus 32. I'm sorry, Exodus 13. No. Exodus 32 first. Let's go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. In Exodus 13, 19, the Bible says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you. And you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So 400 years later, you think about this. God visited him. Moses took the bones of Joseph and brought him to the land of Canaan. Not the Canaanite land, the land of Canaan. The land of Palestine, not the Palestinian land. And he buried Joseph's bones. 400 years later, God visited. In Exodus 32, in verse number 30, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Sounds like America, doesn't it? Gods of Bitcoin, gold, stocks, I don't care. Houses, cars, lands, you know. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. That's unbelievable, man. He had the same prayer that Paul had, man. Paul wished that he himself was a curse for his own people. I've never gotten to that point. I'm sorry. I'm just so glad I'm saved. I wouldn't want to go to hell for anybody. I'm sorry. I just wouldn't. But God used Moses and God used Paul because their mindset cared for other people more than themselves. That's unbelievable. Verse 34, therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken. Oh, verse 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. 
Therefore, now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel, capital A there, shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. You think, you know, a lot of people think, well, this is a sin that's going on with the vaccine pastor and the mandates pastor. No, this is just the result of sin. This is God visiting the sin of our forefathers that were more concerned about their health than godliness, their health more than righteousness, their health more than holiness. This is just a visitation from God. God's showing up. That's all it is. I'm not saying that the vaccination is not a sin. I'm just saying this is a result of sin. It's a result of what happened 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Our social network, not, 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 not online, I'm, I'm talking about the, the social fabric of the government taking care of everybody. This is not the sin here. This is a result of the sin that happened 50, 60 years ago, 80 years ago with FDR. He wanted the government to be your daddy. He wanted the government to be your God. He wanted the government to take care of everything. He wanted the government to take care of everybody instead of God taking care of you. That was the sin. And Americans chose their belly instead of God during the Great Depression. Why not have a job? Oh, you know what? You went to a city to work instead of staying home in the farm. That's all. Grow some tomatoes and peppers and plant some corn. And I know there was a drought and stuff like that. I'm not saying there, you know, I'm not saying it was easy. I'm not saying that. But it would have been a lot better if you had five or ten acres with a mule or two or a cow or two and some chickens. If people in third world countries can live with chickens and goats and cows and cattle and mules, you can too. We're just too full of ourselves and too sophisticated. We want to we force God's hand to live in a wicked city for the government to take care of us. God visited their sin with pestilence, it says. God visited with pestilence. Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. This is a law of God. Start reading verse number 1. Leviticus chapter number 18, verse number 1. The third book in the Old Testament. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Verse number six. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Everybody's uncovering themselves today in America. Did you ever see that? They go online and they post all, all their videos and, and pictures of themselves in undress, showing their flesh and showing their nakedness to the whole world. People walk around, not just in their houses today, but down the street with their underwear. You know, well, I don't care whether it's a bathing suit, looks like a bra and, and panties to me. Verse number 10. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. 
Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness. And by the way, nakedness in the Bible is, is explained in Isaiah 47, verses 1 through 3. Nakedness in the Bible is, is exposing the leg, the thigh, and the Goldilocks. Forget the Goldie part, the locks. Okay? All right. Verse number 18. Verse 17. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they, get, they are near kinswomen. It is wickedness. You know, we make a lot of fun about this. We credit, you know, laugh about this and joke about this. But you'd be shocked how much of this goes on in Tennessee, West Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, down south somewhere, back in the hicks somewhere, up in the mountains. That's why they need hellfire and damnation preaching to keep them straight. I'm just telling you. Because there was a time that you could marry a distant cousin. Third cousin, second cousins. I think it was in the Elvis Presley married his first cousin or something like that. I can't remember exactly or something. Somewhere around there. I'm just saying, there was a time it was acceptable just 50 to 100 years ago. But you need hellfire and damnation in preaching to keep you on your toes and be careful. Don't let your emotions go where they're not supposed to go. Keep reading now, verse number 18. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. That means you're not supposed to marry two sisters. You know, they did practice polygamy in the Bible. So God says, if there's two sisters, you can't marry them at the same time. You have to wait till one passes away. Verse number 19. Also, thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Moreover, thou shalt, we're in Leviticus chapter number 18, the third book in the Bible. Leviticus 18. Verse number 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to, def to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of, the, of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. So God says men ought to be with women and women ought to be with men. And God's very clear in, in Leviticus 18.22 Women are not supposed to sleep with women, and men are not supposed to sleep with men. It's not, it's not complicated. Verse 23, neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Now, I know what the Bible teaches and, 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 and uh, is teaching here. But I'm telling you, if I knew, if I was saved, and I was a child of God, and I read this verse, I wouldn't have a dog or a cat in my bed. And I never have. I never have. But when you have Americans worship their dogs and their cats instead of having children. Greeks do the same thing in Greece, man. They got two, three dogs, but no children. It's unbelievable. And they'll sleep. They, they, it's like they're little babies. They put their pictures on Facebook, you know, and they talk all about their dogs and their cats. But they want women to kill their babies, and they're asking the Supreme Court to kill babies. I don't think we realize how far we've come from God. I don't think we realize how perverted a nation we are. We're worshiping the creature instead of the creator. Tree, we're worshiping trees. The earth, mother earth. Hug, tree huggers. Dogs and cats. While we're killing babies in the womb. Verse 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not you yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. At least the Muslims have some sense when it comes to dogs, man. They got a lot of sense when it comes to dogs. They know the dog is a cursed creature. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a dog. A dog ought to be for protection. A dog ought to be for hunting, maybe. A dog ought to be for different purposes, not to be man's best friend. If your dog is your best friend, you got a problem. You have a personal problem. You have a relationship problem. You know why? Because a dog won't tell you the truth. It's just a lap dog, you know. He'll lick your hand because you feed him. 
And you like that because, you know, you like, you like something liking you back. Well, how about God liking you? Huh? Verse 25, and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit. Long chapter just to get to that word, amen. But I want you to go through all, everything that we went through because it's happening in America today. It's happening in America today. The land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. Why did, Amer why did God allow the white European people to come to America? Because the Native Americans defiled the land. That's why. They're doing abominations, just like the white, white Europeans were doing before Christianity got there with the Druids. They're burning their own children, sacrificing their own children. You know what it is? God visiting. And it's just not, it's just not the Native Americans or the white Europeans. It's the Africans and South Americans. And it's the Chinese and everyone else. Everyone apart from God is cursed, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 28, that the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep my ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. You know why? Because God's going to visit one day. Let's all stand. Dear God, thank you again for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks. I pray that you bless them, give safety for those who are coming. Bless the morning service of follow. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.